Hi guys, welcome back to another Zanex G IGCSC Biology video. So today will be the first part of reproduction, which is chapter 15.1 to 15.4. So mostly it's about reproduction in plants itself, and then it's really similar to the second part of it is reproduction in animals, which you can check out the video above from here. Alright, so let's move on. So firstly, a sexual reproduction. So uh, the definition is a process of resulting in a production of genetically identical offspring from one parent. It means that once uh, like a flower reproduces another flower, it is the same. It is genetically the same. It has the same features, it has the same immune system, everything. It's completely the same. So it's genetically identical. So you can see this is how bacteria is divided by splitting into two. What you call it is a binary fission. So first of a copy of the bacterium DNA is made, and then the cell splits into two. Each new cell has a copy of the DNA. Something is called as mitosis or cell division in one point. Alright. So the advantages for a sexual reproduction in wild species is where you would um, retain the favorable characteristic. It means that those features you have are the same. The the most uh, obvious features will be shown and of course it doesn't really require any mates so everything's done in a single parent and it's fast and you don't have to carry any offspring the disadvantages is therefore it doesn't have any diversity and also it's prone to extinction all right so the another thing is crop production the advantages is that it's higher in yield has higher economic gains, the farmers can keep desired characteristics. The same thing as wild species. And disadvantages is that the whole crop can be wiped out at once if they maybe they catch a disease of one because they have the same genetically identical features, therefore the whole thing will just die out. Extinction. Alright? So the next part of it is sexual reproduction. So right now is the process of involving the fusion of the nuclei of two gamete sex cells to form a zygote and the reproduction of offspring that are genetically different from each other. So a sexual is identical, sexual reproduction is different. All right. So fertilization happens in both a sexual and sexual of male and female gamete nuclei to form a zygote. Zygote is once it's been fertilized. It's called fertilized cell like that. And advantages of it is you get a genetic variation in offspring, easier adaptation to environment, more varieties are being created, and there is a disease resistance to protect you from the diseases that can affect the whole population. The disadvantages is that you, re you need two parents and the growth of it is slower, all right? So what this is, how the process of it happens, same thing as we're going to discuss in um, reproduction in animals, is that male body cell and female body cell each has 23 chromosomes, all right? So one, the sperm cell and the egg cell are called as haploids, and they of course divide by meiosis, and once it's being fertilized, it becomes a zygote. The zygote, therefore, has 46 chromosomes from 23 from the male, 23 from the female. It forms a diploid. Alright. Okay, the sexual reproduction in flowering plants, okay, means plants that have flower or fruits, okay. So, as we know that since they do a sexual reproduction, means both male and female is inside one flower. So, one of it is the carpal and the stamen. Stamen is the male reproductive system of the plant. How do we remember stamen is from male? Through the last three words, men. So, immediately you know it's male. And carpal is the female reproductive system. So, the outside of it, we have the petal, of course and whatever uh, is not inside the reproductive system will be the sepal and the nectary, all right? And then once you go inside, we start off the stamen, there's the anther, the filament, and the sepal. Uh, yeah, sorry, the anther and the filament only. 
and then the couple we have the stigma the style the ovary and the ovule something similar to the penis and the vagina exactly all right so the female parts may vary in different flowers like maybe the egg cells arrangement is different so here's the stigma the style and the pollen grains that were onto there and sticky somehow so that they can attract and stick that pollen grain so that they can reproduce so inside is all the ovule and then the placenta is something like the fe uh, the female reproductive system during fertilization okay so right now there are two different things between insect pollinated and wind pollinated flowers all right so insect pollinated it's brightly colored in their petals why to attract insects and the scent and nectar is for also another way to attract insects so that they can transfer pollen grains and then the number of pollen grains happen in insect pollinated is not to say a lot but in a minimal and moderate amount of pollen grains being um being produced and of yes of course pollen grains are sticky and spikes so that it can attract well with the insect so it sticks and the anthers are much firmly attached so that it can brush against the insect and the stigma again is sticky so that it can stick with the pollen grains together and for wind pollinator it's much smaller and then the colors are just green only so it doesn't have the feature to attract insects and send the nectar they don't have because it's not really a flower wind pollinator can be like grass sometimes and the pollen greens in um, wind pollinator is massive they have a lot in just like one anthers of it it has a lot of pollen greens and it's smooth and light easily carried with the wind this is one of the things called dispersion which is kind of removed in the biology syllabus and anthers is outside the flower where it loose on long filaments to release pollen grains easily and the stigma outside flower is much feathery so that it can form a network to catch drifting pollen grains all right so a and b between flowering and non-flowering or insect pollinated or wind pollinated so yes this is the difference they have the, nearly the same thing it is that they have different features that determine different kind of things all right next one is self-pollination and cross-pollination before that what is pollination so pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma okay and self-pollination there are two types of pollination of course self-pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from the anther of the flower to the stigma of the same flower or different flower on the same plant basically you are pollinating your own self <laughs> okay so self-pollination and cross-pollination is the transfer of pollen grains from an anther of a flower to the stigma of a flower on a different plant of the same species okay let's break down what it means so cross-pollination this is it as the transfer of pollen grains to another plant example that I have a sunflower and the sunflower wants to reproduce when while it cross pollinates, it also must give you a sunflower you only can transfer to a sunflower not a hibiscus not a rose not a, a lavender because it's a different species so it has to be the same species and it can be different plants so this is cross pollination so this is another thing of how it looks like when it goes into pollination all right yes so this is the difference now so same of the same definition you have to remember it does not require an external agency means the single parent is able to help to do that already and both anthers and stigma mature at the same time while cross-pollination takes a different time and the external agent for cross-pollination is wind water insect is always required and then self-pollination is when the occur it can occur when the flower is even close but cross-pollination requires the flower to be open and self-pollination is to provide homozygous offspring and produce a heterozygous offspring you don't really have to know this word and self-pollination does not introduce any variation it's the same thing you're yourself 
pollinating yourself to get the same thing. And cross-pollination is where you get different kinds of colors. So it's a variety of the single speed of the single plant itself. Okay. All right. Next one. Fertilization is the same thing as sexual reproduction in humans also. So first thing is the tube grows out of a pollen stain grain on the stigma. It's something as the, the sperm duct basically and the male gamete goes down the tube all right it goes down the tube so technically since there are a lot of pollen grains only one can pass through it's the same thing as many sperm cells traveling to the vagina only one can go through the the egg cell then the male gamete fuses with the female gamete inside an ovule that's already fertilization ready so that is where it forms a zygote same thing a zygote in a uh, in a human body where it starts to create an embryo all right this is how it looks like another diagram so the stigma the pollen grain the style and the ovule all those only one can enter all right so this is the seeds all right so this is where we start to go into germination so it's swelling over the radical and then the micropile the hilla the testa so it's to protect the inside of the seed. And the bean seed is nearly the same, the cotyledon and the testa, all right? So the fruit after fertilization, the ovary develops into a fruit with one more or seeds inside it, all right? So yes, that's when it leads to germination. So germination means the seed splits and starts to grow into a plant. So what comes first is the roots. Then it starts to curve up to form the stem. So you can see the radical emerges from the testa, the lateral roots begin to grow. The testa falls off and the root system starts to grow. Then it starts to form your stem. So the plumule grows into a shoot. The cotyledon comes above the ground, turns green and starts to do photosynthesis. All right. And yeah, this is another thing. All right. Yes, germination. So again, we have talked about the seed absorbs water and causing the testa to burst and slightly to fall away. So it needs to have a uh, enzyme being activated so it can grow and respiration increase because photosynthesis is happening and starch in the cotyledon broken down into maltose to form energy. So the embryo enlarges, the seed coat bursts open and the radical starts to emerge as an anchor first, then it starts to absorb water and minerals. It's already literally the function of the roots. And then it shoots or plumule and factors that affect germination will be temperature, oxygen, moisture at optimum level so that the enzymes can work well. They cannot work at high temperatures because it will denature. Going back to chapter 5, enzymes, all right? So, yes, see, controlled by enzymes. Literally, if you want to grow something, it requires enzyme to produce your energy, maltose and amylase. So, yes, the factors of it. So, factors of it, let the seed swell and the embryo starts to grow, needed for aerobic respiration for oxygen. And warm is basically uh, the appropriate amount of sunlight. It's basically the what things that a plant needs, basically. All right, so these are the things that it requires for successful germination. So, again, this is another process of how it works from pollination and then it starts to become a zygote and then it starts to form a seed then it starts to germinate into a plant all right so that's all for today's um reproduction in plants so i hope you understand well it's very short only so any questions drop down in the comments below and see you guys in the next video bye bye